academics and research professor Oluwole Familoni FAS, Deputy Vice Chancellor Development Services, <laughs> Professor Ayo Asenwa, <laughs> Deputy <laughs> Vice Chancellor <laughs> Management <laughs> Services, Professor Lucia Obina Shoko. And I'm sure the Director of Academic Planning also here, Professor Mokwelola Olushaken. Other members of the university management, the chairman of our advisory board, distinguished professor Baba Jide Alo FAX, and our guest speaker that I will introduce later. The deans and directors, distinguished ULBS facilitators, director of DBA, uh, participants, guests, ladies and gentlemen, and my guests in the house today too. Good morning to you all once again. I am Ibrahim Oshinobi, the Executive Director of the University of Lagos Business School. The ULBS is an establishment of the University of Lagos, the University of First Choice and the Nation's Pride. Our vision is to be top class business school, recognized globally for excellence and knowledge capable of realizing business potentials. Our mission is to provide innovative business research and training leading to capacity to deliver sound business and entrepreneurial success. The university mission, the NUC Resource Verification Team visited us on the 29th April 2019, and we got approval on the 22nd July 2019 to set up a business school, the University of Lagos Business School, ULBS. And we equally received approval to commence the executive MBA, executive MPH, executive MPA, and executive master of risk management programs. In August 2020, the ULBS was admitted into the membership of the Business Graduate Association based in London. As of today, the U ULBS remains the only business school in Nigeria to be so recognized. On the 12th of May, 2021, the University of Lagos Business School became the fourth business school in Nigeria to be recognized by the Association of African Business Schools based in South Africa. We are already having preliminary discussion with the Association to Advance Collegiate Schools of Business based in Florida for additional global recognition. Our curricula are designed to offer academic quality, promote authentic learning, and skill acquisition. At the ULBS, our coursework is designed to help build professional skills in business, management, leadership, health, and other fields by promoting idea development analytical thinking, planning, and creation. A unique learning culture and environment bridge the gap between theory and practice. Preparing our participants, that is our students, to apply their knowledge and skills in the workplace. Indeed, it's our policy at the University of Lagos Business School that no single lecturer facilitates a course. Facilitation involves an academician and at least one highly experienced industry practitioner. The idea here is to bring the classroom and the industry under one single roof. This special seminar was therefore instituted to match the gown with the town and remove the gulf between theory and practice. It is part of the coursework for our participants. In fact, they will write a report on today's presentation. However, we believe strongly that since our mandate is to raise global leaders, we have extended invitation to those at the senior management level of our university. The success, progress, and prosperity of a business firm depend on a lot of having an effective and efficient procurement process. Indeed, procurement often takes up 
a significant portion of a fan's has a direct impact on the bottom line of the company. value to all managers and leaders. And who else is in the best position to offer this much needed insight other than a personality that have operated creditably in this space, the identity of whom shall be revealed shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a greatly rewarded. Thank you all and God bless. The remarks of the Vice Chancellor of the University of Lagos and those of the ULBS Advisory Board Chair will come later, as presently they are unavoidably absent. Okay. So I will go quickly to the citation of our guest speaker. This is actually an abridged citation so that the citation itself does not turn into another inaugural lecture. So it's, I'm going to make it as brief as possible. Citation of engineer Emeka Moma Eze, OFR. Engineer Eze was born in Alo in the present in the middle south local government area of Anambra State on February 16, 1958. He attended St. John's Secondary School, graduating in 1977 as the best student in the Indian local government with grade one distinction, having had an aggregate of eight. In 1983, he graduated from the University of Nigeria, Onzuka, in second class upper division, civil engineering, winning the Dr. C.C. Agwin Prize as the best graduating student in foundation engineering, structural analysis, and structural design. In 1990, he obtained a master's degree in civil engineering from the University of Lagos, the University of First Choice, and the Nation's Pride. Engineer Eze was involved in the design and supervision of several federal and state highways as well as many buildings. For 22 years, Emeka was in private sector of the economy working for many conglomerates like Mobil, Texaco, Nigerian Bureaus, Elf, and several other government institutions and private firms. In 2002, engineer Eze was appointed a sector specialist by the Oba Sonjo regime to work with Mrs. Obi Ezekwisili. CFR in the State House Abuja in the newly established budget monitoring and price intelligence unit. With the passage of the Public Procurement Act 2007, Engineer Eze was appointed the Acting Director General of Public Procurement. He served in that capacity for 18 months and on January 2009, President Yara Dua confirmed him as the pioneer DG, Bure of Public Procurement. He served as the DG of the Bure for eight and a half years till February 16, 2016. As the DG of BPP, Engineer Eze created a niche for himself by successfully midwifing the establishment of the new procurement Bure. He established the procurement cadre as a new profession within the federal government, set new regulations on public procurement, establish pricing benchmarks for federal projects, developed and deployed new standard bidding documents for procurement of works, goods, and services across the nation. The Bureau under him reviewed and certified over 4,500 projects across the length and breadth of Nigeria and saved Nigeria 
758 billion naira in projects review between 2009 and 2015. A benchmark for prices of tender projects. World Bank Governors Forum and the World Bank Engineer AZ saw to the establishment of procurement laws in 26 out of the 36 states of the Federation before he left office. A thoroughly bred professional, Engineer AZ is renowned civil engineer and was in 1994 elected the chairman of Nigerian Society of Engineers, Lagos branch, and later vice president and deputy president of the national body. And in 2006 to 2007, he served as the silver president, the 25th president of the same society. Engineer Eze brought uncommon commitment to the discharge of his responsibilities as the chief executive of the Bureau of Public Procurement that today the whole nation has come to know due process as a way of life. Engineer Eze has been decorated with several awards and served in over 80 committees of the federal government. For eight and a half years, Engineer Eze was in attendance at the Federal Executive Council meeting and served in virtually all committees of the federal government. He was a management implementation, implementation team. He is well versed in governance issues and represented Nigeria in several international fora, especially at the United Nations Convention against corruption and United Nations General Assembly. He is a fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Nigerian Academy of Engineers, Nigeria Institute of Engineers, the American Society of Engineers, and many others. Engineer Eze is a certified international procurement professional and a shattered civil structural engineer. In 2011, the Federal University of Technology, Oweri, awarded him as an honorary doctorate of science for his services to the nation in procurement reform. Engineer Eze established the first ever procurement research center at the Federal University of Technology, Oweri, in 2012. In 2012, the nation honored Engineer Eze with the National Award of the Officer of the Order of the Federal Republic, OFR. He is happily married to Inkeshi, and they are blessed with three children. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure, privilege, and honor to present a trailblazer, a colossal pathfinder, a calculated administrator by excellence, an extremely disciplined, diligent, hardworking, highly cerebral, dedicated to duty, greatly resourceful, highly industrious personality today, a visionary with an epitome of humility and versatility. Dr. Engineer Emeka Moma, AZ, OFR. You have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you. Good morning. I hope I was wondering whether who you were reading about what this this is for was all about me. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Abraham Osinogri, Executive Director, University of Lagos Business School. Mr. Vice Chancellor, University of Lagos, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Chair President, Director of Academics, our revered uh, Professor Laws, Directors. And especially, let me single out Dr. Ibrahim Oshinabu, the executive director. I want to thank you for this opportunity you've given me to come and share my thoughts. And I want to also thank our invited participants and friends. I want to use the opportunity to inform you that I have taken your liberty of approval to invite some of my friends. Some of them are here already and very senior engineers in the society. I can see Professor Sama Defila. I can see Professor Obuefi from University of Nigeria, and campus from the School of Mental Studies. I have also some people from America. My daughter, who has a PhD in chemical engineering, is joining from University of Reading, London, and she's here, and many, many others. 
So I want to thank you for this opportunity uh, for my thoughts on this uh, lecture. And um, the, my lecture outline is simply like this. I will, after the introduction, I will begin to share my thoughts about procurement, dwelling specifically on the difference between public and private uh, procurement. Then I will talk a little bit about how a company can grow its business and then share ex opportunities in public sector procurement. And then talk a little bit about the procurement process and highlight the difference between the private sector and the public sector. And then we'll take a little time to talk about baselining of expenditure that will guide you to see where to focus on your expenditure. And then share about good procurement outcome and the requirements for good procurement outcome. And then we'll conclude. I believe that by the time we spend one and a half hours, we are done. Basically, my presentation should be laced with experiences of my interaction over the years dealing with federal institutions and others. And so, of course, um, as business is becoming more competitive, acquisition of of inputs for business operations, as well as management of expenditure to support operations are recognized as key business drivers. Therefore, the knowledge of the strategic roles which procurement can play in the survival and growth of business is therefore very important. As the cost of inputs and expenditures are optimized through efficient procurement process, profitability and sustainability in business are assured. Therefore, many companies will need to exploit the benefits of procurement professionals in their business operations with a view to achieving cost optimization. Meanwhile, while procurement professionals are often called upon to devise strategies to generate significant cost savings, the need to reduce supply lead time, reduce inventory and increase quality levels cannot be ignored. Therefore, procurement is to be integrated with the space of the organization as future business growth strategies are planned. As you're planning your business to grow, you must begin to integrate into your organization, your procurement plans. Therefore, procurement professionals can also assist companies grow their business by understanding, by understanding the public sector procurement. Because if you do not understand public sector guidelines, you're not likely going to be useful to your organization, especially if, you have, if your organization is involved in providing services for public sector organization. So let's dwell some time to talk about public sector perspective. And before then, what is a procurement? It's generally defined as acquisition. When you want to acquire something, just generally. And, but when public institutions are involved, in the acquisition process, it calls public procurement. Therefore, the use of public funds to acquire public goods, works, and services is therefore public procurement. And because huge firms are involved, public procurement is usually guided by legal frameworks to enthrone transparency, accountability, value for money, and prevent corruption or abuse of office by public officials. This is also to avoid discretionary application of rules. How did this thing come about? Article 9 of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, UNCAC, mandates all member nations to establish a, a, a public procurement regime that is based on a legal framework. So Nigeria's journey to a public procurement regime began when on December 9th, 2003 and December 24th, October 2004, we joined membership of UNCAP and ratified it by National Assembly respectively. And what does Article 9 of that UNCAP law say? It mandates each member party 
shall in accordance with the fundamental, fundamental principles of the legal system, take the necessary steps to establish a proper system of procurement based on transparency, competition, and the objective criteria in preventing corruption. That is what the law expects them. The system should provide for one, and it's very important that we underline this, public distribution of information relating to procurement procedures. And that explains why we have what is called a tender journal, including information on invitation to tender and relevant or pertinent information on the award of contracts, allowing potential tenderers sufficient time to prepare and submit their tender. This is a, a, a general principle that Hello. the human law must contain. Hello. That the law must yeah, also yeah, have yeah. a system I know, I don't know I that establishes in advance conditions for participation, including selection and award criteria okay. and rules. And this are why any, uh, any, any tendering advertisement you see uh, will tell you, 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 must, you, must, you must have this, you must have this. Have this, you must have this. These are the criteria being set ahead of time. The law on public perception also includes that there's going to be predetermined criteria. Please, can somebody move it to the nation? The system requires that an effective system of domestic review an effective system of domestic review, including an effective system of appeal to ensure legal recourse and remedies in the event that the rules or procedures pursuant to this are not followed. And that explains that you need to have a regulator. That's what you're saying. That's why we have the Bureau of Health Procurement serving as a appeal uh, body to ensure that if a, a public sector body does not follow the rules, they will compel them to follow the rules. And then of course, including matters that will ensure that officers that are charged with the responsibility of managing procurement act in a manner that is uh, not threatening uh, the confidence in the system by ensuring that the issue of um, conflict of interest is addressed. The, the UN Commission on Inter the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, etc., had since 1994 developed a model law on public procurement. This law was revised in 2011 to accommodate the use of information technology in public procurement while recognizing new procurement methods. However, Nigeria modeled her own Procurement Act 2007 after the 1994 model law on public procurement. And that means that Nigeria's law does not contain the revisions as contained in the Unstructured Model Law. Such methods like reverse option procurement method, framework agreements, competitive dialogue, e-procurement are, are not present, but I'm aware and I'm working with the Bureau and other members to ensure that these new uh, are incorporated in Nigeria's law, because there's a proposal to amend Nigerian procurement law to accommodate these new developments. So a legal framework is just needed to clearly and procedures that will lead to the award of government contracts to remove discretionary application of rules. It is the backbone of the entire procurement process that ensures that more public goods, works and services are delivered for less, value for money is achieved, and builds public confidence in government. It is, in fact, a critical driver of good governance. The main elements of public procurement are procedures to identify, specify, and announce the goods and works and services to be procured and to determine which companies are eligible to participate, requirements for open tendering, except there is justification for restricted tendering. 
re-establish evaluation and award procedures and review or bid challenge procedures. Transparency enhancement through mandatory open advertisement for contracts, except as may be allowed otherwise. That common procurement is a partnership between the giver of contracts, which is government public institution, and the receiver of contracts, a private company, for a delivery of public goods, works, and services. A private company for a consideration assists the public sector to achieve its mandate. Each public institution is set up to deliver a mandate. But in trying to achieve those mandates, they naturally may, do not have the internal capacity to do them. And so the need to engage a third person to help them do that becomes mandatory. And even most private organizations as well, they are not set up to achieve all, the, they don't have the capacity to do all they are set out to do in, in relation to their main mandates. And so the process of engaging a third person to help them deliver some of these things is what procurement is all about. So what about the regulatory and economic, given its market value, public procurement is a true value chain and therefore impacts the efficiency and competitiveness of domestic and international markets through public-private interactions. It affects the procurement of intellectual services and through it, the development of national consulting industry and the knowledge economy. Public procurement affects the behavior of public and private entities and ought to support the involvement of national companies in our developmental projects through its element of integrity, stability, and predictability of outcomes. In other words, when there is confidence in public acquisition procedures, what is saying in effect is that we improve efficiency through market competition. International companies can effectively and confidently compete, even and knowing that uh, there are set, set guidelines that will guide the outcome because that is a major issue. And when you do that, you drive down cost. You remember that when GSM came, there were only one or two of them, they were able to fix prices. And but when the third person came in the form of glow, prices of uh, SIM cards crashed. And ever since, there have been very big competition to the extent that today, in 2001 or thereabout, when they rolled out, the first thing was costing 20,000 Naira then, SIM card. But today, uh, companies are begging us to come and collect SIM card free. This is the, the, the benefit of competition when you, and that's what the property procurement is there to do, to engender competition so that you can drive down costs. But that cannot happen if the private sector does not perceive that the rules are clear, that the actors are sincere and knowledgeable, and then we take decision based on those uh, criteria. And so what are those features? At national and sub-national levels, the ministry governments and local governments, public procurement legislation support participation of local and domestic industry. There is a section of the law that provides for margin for the margin of domestic preference, where local companies are normally give preference over international companies for certain levels of procurement. For instance, if there's an international building that a local company submit for works, a cost higher than by seven and a half percent of the international funds, even though his fund is uh, higher by seven and a half percent, then the law mandates the procuring entity to give the job to a local company. In the case of supply of goods, manufactured locally and internationally, so long as the goods meet up with the requirements of the agency, the law requires that the local companies have a 15% margin of, of uh, preference. In other words, if my cost is uh, 115,000 of million and the local international firm bids 100 million, the procuring entity is under obligation to give it to me at 115 million, even though I'm higher by that margin. And so it's so supported by executive order five issued on February 18 by President uh, Muhammad Buhari. So for procurement, it talks about efficiency, competition, accountability, transparency, fairness, and economy. These are the features of public procurement. And in the course of this interaction, I will elucidate further on them. Then let's take a look at private sector. 
On the other hand, private sector or corporate procurement is based on companies aiming to achieve the best possible economic results for private interests following internal or corporate procurement procedure. In most cases, the functions include purchasing inputs used in the firm's value chain. Their procurement activities are not subject to public scrutiny. And that is a very, very important uh, uh, difference. However, wrong procurement can impact their profitability and hence their survival and their survival negatively. If the cost of your input is so high, of course, their selling cost will be also high and you'll be knocked out of market in a competitive environment, you will not be competitive. And over time, your products and services will be so expensive that you have no option than to go down. This may include raw materials that they need, supplies and other consumables items, as well as assets like machinery. Because if the cost of acquisition of the input is so high, then of course that will affect their cost of selling price of the products. Purchased inputs may in some cases relate to primary activities as well as support activities. Primarily procurement is seen as a support activity rather than a primary activity. For instance, if you work in the brewing industry, for instance, that their main job is brewing, they have their procurements that will include purchase of inputs like grains that they will need for bottles, uh, pallets, and then spares, repairs of their, of their, of their facilities, and, and the laboratories, the equipment, and grains, and all that, and storage, bottles, pallets, forklifts. These are the things they need to support the operations. But if, and they all impact on the cost of the cost of their product, cost of their beer. And so if their cost is so expensive, then obviously the cost of a bottle of beer will be so expensive. And in a competitive environment, they all will all go out of business. So it becomes important that in trying to engage those services, they optimize their cost so much so that they will be competitive at the end of the day. Therefore, a company that's deficient in the procurement of inputs to its activities will naturally grow its business, both in terms of profitability and more likely to innovate to survive in any sector. So what are those classification of materials that are normally procured by private firms? You can say raw materials that the base used for their production purposes. You can have what's called supplementary materials or materials that are used during production like lubricating oil, gases, welding electrodes. These are consumable supplementary materials or semi-manufactured products that are already process ones but need to process further and then before you can turn into your own products. Then of course you have some components that are manufactured goods which under, will undergo additional changes like batteries and engine parts and the, most of assembling parts, component parts, they, when they say they manufacture the vehicles here, they're bringing semi-manufactured products together and coupling them. And if the cost of bringing those things are too expensive, then of course the selling price will also be expensive. Part of where they spend money is capital investment, position of land, factory buildings, computers and machines, et cetera. If I buy my land, say for 100 million, and you buy your own for 200 million, or somebody serves as middle one and overstates the cost, obviously I have had an inbuilt cost there that I have to deal with. The same thing with all the items that you use to run your business, as well as maintenance, repairs, and operating materials, consumables. If your consumables are so expensive, definitely to have impact on your profitability and your business growth. Of course, services. These are services, activities executed by third parties, suppliers and contractors, engineering firms, as organizations try to support themselves. So in general, if you put the public procurement and private procurement side by side, you see that the public procurement serves the public. There's a higher amount of regulations and public uh, interest in it. The procurement process is slow because uh, the amount of money involved is huge. Budget is tight. 
and there is public uh, national assembly oversight and legal recourse. Unlike in the private sector, their own major essence of private procurement is to support to make profit. There are few regulations. The process is fast. It doesn't require any public inquiry into how they spend their money. Their budget is flexible and they can deliver faster because it doesn't require, they're not accountable to anybody except to the shareholders and all that. But they, to that extent, they still want to make profit and remain in business. So how does a, a, a company grow its business? Of course, simple. Within the context of the public sector, if you're a contractor, a service provider, you can only grow your business if you are very knowledgeable in the rules governing participation in public procurement. For you to do that, you must have that at the fingertips. You must, it's a must. Let me share some opportunities that are available in the public sector in 2021. The federal government has a capital provision of 5.1 trillion in the 2021 appropriation and distributed as such in the various ministries. And you have them from one to almost 46 ministries and distributed on these figures. So you see the number of agencies that are there for each of the ministries. There are about 935 agencies where you can go and get businesses, right? And you, for the ministry, you have their total capital of about 2.8 trillion, and then at the agencies, 2.3 trillion, totaling 5.19 trillion as distributed. And if you go to Ministry of Agriculture, for instance, you have, they, have, they have about 211 billion in capital expenditure at um, total. About MDAs and where they have 140 billion available for you to compete for. And then the headquarters about 71. Then you go to Federal Ministry of Works, they have its MDAs and sharing for 2 billion the headquarters 347 billion. Then Minister of National Planning, you begin to wonder why, how would Minister of National Planning have such huge amount of money? They have about 1.4 trillion in Ministry of Finance, Budget and National Planning. Most of their money is on capital supplementation, provision for debt management office and all that and all that. And they have many ministries, Office of Accountant General, Service Wise Board, and the rest. So you can see in the chart, if you see the allocation of capital, where you find that Federal Minister of Finance has 27.74%, the highest. That highest is due to debt management office provision of 3.3 trillion and service wide vote provision of 1.95 trillion, and the rest are distributed. The next highest one is capital supplementation, where the national assembly 20.25% on zonal projects. And then, of course, state owned enterprises, then Federal Minister of Works and Housing, and then Federal Minister of Resources, and across water resources, education, uh, health, yeah. and all that. And some are even so small that there are no much businesses. Uh, Business Therefore, companies which provide services to federal government and her agencies, either as contractors, suppliers, consultants, must necessarily be conversant with the rules guiding participation in public procurement. Many state governments have also adopted public procurement laws in their states. However, my, impression, my opinion or my experience is that the implementation of, of the law at the state level is still a challenge. Against all known best practices, some state governments pay as much as 70% as advance payment to contractors. Some of them have argued that this is to ensure that projects are delivered on time. 
However, one is worried that the valid money principle of public expenditure cannot be guaranteed under such circumstances. Then what about private companies' growth strategy? Private companies can also grow their business by optimizing the cost of their inputs to their final products. Their purchasing functions will traditionally encompass the process of buying. This involves determining the needs, selecting the contractors, arriving at appropriate prices, specifying terms and conditions, issuing contract orders and following up proper delivery and payment. Simple, almost the same thing in the private sector, except that the times are short, the approving authorities are fewer and then they take the decision quicker and faster. And so if you look at it, from the private sector perspective, that is, once you have a, a, a requisition for anything, that is the department that reviews it, many a time a team by the payment department, then from there it goes, approve, if it's within their budget, you say once they approve, then create a purchase order, send for, for qualification of people to send in their request, it goes, analyze the vendor, and then you come back, the job is done. If it is rejected, you send back to the person who made the requisition. Simple, straight to the point. And then it's all like this, where you put a sourcing methodology, where you define your requirements, you categorize and strategize and analyze, identify the supplier. The process of identifying supplier would depend on In some cases, most companies have a team of contractors. The danger of having a particular team of contractors is that you are denied the opportunity of competition brings. Then issue them request for proposals or for quotations, you negotiate the contract, you manage the contract, and then that goes on. Then compare with the public sector procurement. Basically, open tendering process is the one that is allowed as a default procurement method. But there are occasions where you don't have to do so, what's called restricted tendering process. In that case, you will need approval of the regulated bureau to proceed. And so for the open tendering process, all you need to do is to issue a contract advert, do a pre-qualification expression of interest as the case may be. Pre-qualification is simply a statement of capability, allowing companies to define who they are, what they have done, their, stand, their, their capacity, and then thereafter you do a short list of people, usually not more than seven, and then issue them bidding documents and then ask them to submit their terms of reference the information package, and then they'll submit their bid And in, in some cases, there could be need for clarification procedure. And then when that happens, you regular meeting of our national executive council and the voice part of the job that's the part of the job so we recognize you sir. when you are done you come to negotiate for small works you go to the BPP for no objection and then when the BPP issues no objection you go to federal executive council and you are awarded if it doesn't require going to BPP, you just go to your tender board and then award. For restricted tender where you don't have to advertise, what is the process? You approach the BPP for approval to do direct procurement if the item is either manufactured by one person or is a, is a restricted or you is a spare. Assuming I want to buy a spare to fix a Caterpillar equipment, I can only get it from Caterpillar. So I just go straight to Caterpillar dealers. So I get, I approach BPP to give me um, uh, approval to do so. And when that happens, you negotiate with them, do clarifications, depending on the amount. If it is small, you go to your tenders board, approve. If it is big, you go to BPP for no objection, they will review it, give you no objection, you go to fake and approve. Then there's the other one of restricted tendering, where 
there are few companies that are involved in that. And then in the process, you may have to do a short list of four or five people. You still need to go to BPP to get that approval. Thereafter, you issue bidding document to the bidders. There may be need for clarification or pre-bid meetings to contractors to clarify any issue in the bidding document. Then they will do bid submission. Thereafter, you do bid evaluation, clarification if any, and then the process goes down. For small amount, you go to a tender board. If it's above your tender board, you go to your ministry supervising you in the case of public sector, then they approve. Then if it is one that is above your threshold that requires no objection, you go to BPP for no objection. When they issue you, you go to Federal Executive Council. That is the process for the public sector procurement. It is important to also look at baselining expenditure. If you want, to, what do you mean by baselining expenditure? Most companies do not have record of how much they spend in a, in a year on items. So when they're trying to grow their business, they do not know how to begin to cut, uh, how to cut uh, costs and where to cut costs. And so there's a, a kind of a mapping methodology that has been devised to assess the cost of elements that uh, impact on your cost. For instance, if you're involved in a cast now, I'll just use that as an example to do the sliding model method. It helps you to clearly identify the volume and annual spend on each of the inputs to your production. Assuming I'm doing a casting, for instance, and there are three elements in casting, investment cost involving the materials that I'm going to, then there's the kind of sand you need, and then the dye. And there are certain products that I am using, either steel or aluminum for each of the items. If I want to cast steel material, for instance, I will need an investment on it, I will need sand, I will need a dial. If it's going to be aluminum, same thing. So for each of them, you identify them. Then you come assuming I'm going to produce spoon, spoon for instance, stainless spoon. I will need how much do I need to, how much does it cost me to buy the mold and the sand and all that? And that's product one. And I will say, how many units of it do I produce in a year? I say it is 20,000, for instance. And what is the cost of each one is this. So you, you, for each item, for each product, you break them down into the volume and the unit cost, and then you put total them. So at a glance, you say, hey, I'm spending X amount of money on this in each of these items, because that will help you in determining the selling price and the cost. You as a private person will want to see how much of this is to Naira, can I, can I produce it at, at 50? Because bringing in that at 50 will impact a, a gain of 12 Naira on my annual spend. Then how do I go back? I need to go back at the cost of input of what this investment can see how much of it I can reduce. And then say, how have I been getting my cost? Is it through particular contractors or through what vendors? And so once you're able to do this, it gives you an idea of where your money is going and therefore where you have to optimize your inputs. So once the annual expenditure on each item is established, Cost optimization strategies can be deployed to lower cost through procurement improvements. And so what is good procurement outcome? Because paying the right price at the right time in the right quantity and the right quality to the right contractor supplier is key to the growth of any business. Once any of these rights is missing, then the outcome will be wrong. Because once you make a right, wrong choice of a contractor, that project is already compromised because the contractor will be there forever. If you are building, if you are delivering the project at a point that people don't need it, a time in, in Nigeria, there were times we were building two bedroom bungalows for people. And we went to the
Hello, sir. You are frozen, sir. Sorry, uh, I think uh, my network uh, went off a little bit. Uh, yes, you you went off a little bit. Yes, I'm, am I back? Yes, you are back, sir. Back, sir. Okay, let me see where I was before. Sorry, his network. Yes. Benga, can you share? I don't know where I was stopped before. Uh, the point where I chose a contractual time matters. Slide 38, 39, sir. Slide 39, okay. Let me come back. Sorry, it's my network. I don't know what, what happened. Knock me off. Okay. So yeah, I think that's, that's where I was. I've gone. Slide 40, sir. Yeah, slide 40. Slide 40, sir. <clears throat> so. That's where where I was. Yes. Good. So I was saying that um, if you have a procurement that does not uh, address the right quality, right quantity, and right time, you will not achieve value for money. So the whole concept of value for money is when everything is done at the right time. The five right hours, as we call it in procurement. Yes, the, what is the outcome of public procurement? You see the, the, the effects? In the case of housing, obviously what you are, want to achieve is to move this house to this house. This road that everybody everybody wants, everybody will be comfortable with this kind of road everywhere. And then of course darkness, we all know the challenges we're having with power, electricity, our roads, infrastructure, and water. So the outcome of a good procurement is this one's on the right side. For the private sector, of course, you have increased turnover, increased profits, business expansion, large networks, employment generation, because uh, when companies are growing, they have need for more hands and they uh, uh, engage more hands. And that's uh, the whole essence of growth, the essence of business. The essence of business is to grow economy. The essence of growing economy is to generate employment, make profits, expand, and improve the life and conditions, living conditions of uh, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, requirements for good procurement at come. Mm -hmm. What I call PPT. These are three critical pillars that are very necessary for good procurement at come. The people, the process, and technology. Because people must be competent, and there is, as a procurement or a, a, an organization, you must deal with new issues and what you call change management. People, because procurement is a new way of removing that discretion, each time you want to introduce any new thing, people are going to react. And so, and I'm sure a lot of us in the public sector have that experience that people react to changes. More so when the changes, they don't understand what it means. They are driven by fear of what they're going to lose, the control they're already having, they're going to be afraid. So they're going to, so you have to deal with that. And then competency management, there's need to uh, teach people for them to know exactly what their responsibilities are, how to manage it, there's need to build capacity. And of course, their relationship management in terms of their relationship with other departments, because procurement by, all, by themselves are not an island, they're part of an organization. And therefore they must work with other, other departments 
to deliver the common objective of the organization, either as public sector or private sector. In the case of the process, the, the tragedy of the Nigerian situation is that the contractors are not seen as strategic partners to government or governance, both at the government at, at, and public and uh, private sector. Contractors are so important because they are partners. It's a, it's a, it's a win-win relationship that ought to exist between the giving the contract, which is the public sector or the company, and the contract, because if the contract understands your needs and your, your, your requirements very well, and you're able to develop them to understand what is expected of them, the chances of them going uh, wrong and your, 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 the ability to survive them becomes much, much simpler for you. So the need to develop uh, contractors as a strategic part of procurement development is very key by building their capacity, their understanding of the rules, so important. And of course, technology. Technology is turned out to mean to become a very uh, kind of a tool that you can do, you cannot do without. In other words, the most that uh, procure, uh, technology is, is begin to drive uh, procurement through introduction or use of e procurement to so reduce discretional application of human interaction. Where, oh, I know this person is my friend. He was my schoolmate. Uh, okay, let's just leave it. Let's, let's give it to him. But you know, technology is blind to such a sentiment. They will say against lay down criteria, it, the result comes out neatly. And when that happens, they are, they, they are, the effect is that it builds confidence in the, in the populace. People are forced to develop and improve their, 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 their methodology to remain relevant. And those who are already there will be struggling to keep up by delivering good services. At the end of the day, everybody benefits. And when it is done in such a manner okay. as to use human elements, things are that uh, you don't get things done well. So you need, in effect, people with the right skills and knowledge to drive your procurement process. They must understand that the industry very well, as well as become conversant with the company's aspiration as in terms statement. And of course, the reason why the company exists as in their mission statement and the company's core values. These are the key drivers. Procurement professional must understand the goals and the objectives of the company at any point in time and will be innovative enough to design strategies and action plans to achieve them. They must of, an, of necessity be capable of relating with industry experts to be abreast with latest developments in the sector and relate with, well with other departments. Because if you don't do that, you will be working on your own. And of course, you will be working against the interests of the company. So what are those questions that procurement officers are expected to answer? These include, what is the type of service that is needed by my organization or by the department? Departments have services to other departments. He said, why is the service needed? Procurement officers must be able to answer this question. Because in drafting your procurement uh, strategy, you must answer this question. What type of service is needed? In other words, I want to paint a house. I want to buy a car. There's a service that is needed. I want to buy a computer. I want to build a house. I want to build a road. Why is the service needed? I need to get an office because I don't have enough space. My people are standing. I want to have enough seats for my staff that they want to. I want to buy a computer because my people cannot do this. I want to buy a generator because we don't have a steady power supply. When is it needed? You must decide, oh, I need it. I'm going to recruit 20 people more in the next uh, two months that are supposed to resume. So I must get the, seat, uh, the furniture ready before they come. That is when it's needed. So you have to answer those questions. What are the details? Have you defined the scope of work or the details? What type of table or furniture you need, the size, the location, and all that? Who can, who can best provide the services? When you are now designing the specifications for the contractors, they said, do I need a contractor who has built a road before, or do I need a general contractor? Assuming I want to build a road, 
Okay, people, I, want, I need to, to decongest a papa wolf. What are those things I need to do to decongest? Who can, who and who are best qualified to do that service? Do I need someone who has done it before? Or is it a consortium and all that? For most less projects, how late can you find a company being able to do all? So they come into a partnership as a consortium. I want to build a power plant. What level of competence do I need? I had to specify them in the, this answer. Who can best provide the services? Has the service been procured before by the organization or by the yes? Was the requirement satisfied? This is the question. If you have done it before, you say, who did it? Was the service okay? What lessons did we learn from that? And what can we do better to make it better? So you ask yourself, can this thing be provided in-house? If this can be provided in house, who within the house can do that? These are the questions the procurement person must answer. And then, is the is external expertise needed to assist with definition of requirements and with the evaluation and selection? For instance, for complex project, assuming I want to expand my factory, I'm, 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 let me use brewery again. I, I want to build another plant in Enugu or so, somewhere, like when Nigerian Brewery was built, I'm a brewery. Did they have the, 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 the internal staff to handle the design? The answer was no. So they have to say, okay, we need a, a set of consultants, architects, engineers to go and get that, that done. So they will engage experts, consultants to define the scope of work after everything. So that's the question. If you don't have internal capacity, you need external consultants. That's where the selection of consultants comes in. And then of course, contractors and the rest. Is the service expected to be one-off or continuous? Many a time for building factories, maybe you don't build factories every day, but for inputs to your production, like when you are using um, raw materials, maize, so on, for instance, is a normal basis. So such ones, you may decide to adopt a different procurement strategy that will require call off at on need basis. We have what you call framework agreements, where you, you pre qualify people who are into that business and tell them, hey, you are agreeing on a particular cost. Whenever I need you within the framework, you deliver. Because I may not have enough uh, storage facilities to keep all my, all my wares at the same time. And so, you need to answer this question. What is the expected duration of the service? What is the construction period? What is the delivery period? And this can only be answered if you have an idea yourself of how this thing can be done. If at source, what is the procurement lead time? In other words, what, what time do I need procurement process? Especially for public sector procurement, the minimum time that uh, might be allowed for you, otherwise you will not have complied with the objectives of the public procurement regulation. In other words, you must give people sufficient time to see the adverts and have to get us together. You don't just wait until last month in the year when the budget is about to close and say you want to begin to advertise for procurement. When the law requires you to give at least 30 days notice, for instance. So you, you must start early to do the procurement plan early enough. And then at that, you ask what procurement method is best suited for solicitation of service providers? What procurement method? Procurement method means, are you going to advertise? Are you going to do direct procurement? Are you going to do restrictive tendering? Are you going to do international bidding? Are you going to do national bidding or single source? So depending on what, these are the questions that the procurement person must answer as he's developing the procurement strategy. Then he said, what department committee will be responsible for implementation? What I have found missing in most of our procurement is that they don't have contract management strategy implementation committee that sees the implementation of projects because technical departments alone on their own cannot supervise and get the projects done because they are not responsible for payments. If the person responsible for payment is in the 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 plan, chances are that when invoices are raised, it goes in there, he keeps it by the side. 
But if they are part of the uh, contract management team that will say, hey, you are responsible for raising invoice. You raise the invoice, it goes to a social person. This person has the responsibility to take it to this point all as part of the team. So that when it goes to the, the person paying, he doesn't have to start asking questions that ordinarily would have been attended to at the control management committee level. So with that, projects can be delivered much more on time. At the private sector level, they have it, but at the public sector is missing. Then they ask, what is the budget? How much money do I have and I should have? The challenge with the public sector is that you may have it, the money may not get released. Or when it's released, it's released in such a manner that the projects are not, uh, you can't even pay a standing invoice and all that and all that. So that's the challenge anyway. I say, are funds available? Private sector, yes. Public sector, yes and no. In some cases, most of the time, available but not on time or not sufficient. Or the goods for when use. Occasions will require that when you are procuring some goods, you will store them strategically to avoid cost overrun. But in a stable economy, it will amount to a tying down of your capital if you stock materials that you can only use in, in nine months' time. So it doesn't make economic sense for stock materials that you use nine months' time when you can easily get it on the need basis. So uh, that goes for a stable economy where the, 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 uh, the economy is macroeconomic is, uh, is stable, so it's predictable. Is the stock for storage or do you have enough storage facilities? These are the questions. You have had instances where people will procure items only for them to not have a place to store them. And then it will be left out there. But then a good procurement person will answer these questions. By the time you finish them, they all be part of the contract management strategy that you would have developed. And these are many more questions that the question the procurement professional should try to provide answers for. The procurement process. To keep management process fair, transparent, efficient, a good understanding of the procurement process flow is key. The flow processes for both the private and public sectors are as detailed in the chat headed before. Of course, technology. Of course, ICT infrastructure encompassing, encompassing fundamental facilities and systems that support sustained functionality of institutions and companies that are necessary for efficient procurement system. In other words, if you don't have computers in the modern time, you don't have data, you don't have a warehousing, data warehousing capability. You can't even you, you can't even call back your experiences. So calling back experiences from the previous procurement is key. So you are improving your system. Not not only because of this, but the use of technology with COVID nineteen pandemic pandemic of twenty twenty. The use of innovative procurement methods. That in short, quick and fast decisions of the winning base have become inevitable. Using procurement methods, competitive dialogue, reverse auction, the use of social media platforms, also taking center stage, especially within uninformed or informal sector for solicitation of bids. We see that happening where people are now selling their wares, selling their marketing their products using social media, Facebook, and all that. So it's becoming a tool now in procurement where people can uh, go fish at information to solicit uh, um, suppliers. So it's all part of uh, the new technology that is involved. Collecting data, sorting out, storing, analyzing previous procurement records so as to understand the trend is crucial to your business growth. If you do not know how much you are spending, maintaining your facilities, Chances are that you'll be pricing yourself below your cost price. And that's the problem most uh, uh, private, uh, SMEs have. They do not have data uh, on how, to the extent at the end of the day, they are selling their uh, 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 products at cost, the operating uh, uh, cost. So in conclusion, as the Nigerian economy struggles to get out of the doldrums arising from the global COVID-19 pandemic, Access to business opportunities in the public sector has become more competitive. 
under the new legal public expenditure procurement regime. Therefore, knowledge of the rules guiding participation in public procurement becomes essential for business, businesses delivering services to the public sector. Knowledge of the procurement process will also help companies optimize their cost of acquisition of infused production or cost of their business. You know, good, you know, good knowledge and skill in procurement, acquisition of goods and works are key to the growth of any business in the competitive market economy. On this note, I want to thank you for listening. I hope I have not bored you. Let me apologize for the, for the network again. So thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I think Thank that, you, sir. sir. Abraham was telling me you have to play again in case of questions and all that. Thank you, sir. Dr. Ifiri. We have more talents and for you. I have some questions, some hands up for questions. I don't know whether I'm, Professor Sunib, are you facilitating the question? Yes, we will facilitate it for you, sir. Okay. Dr. Ifere, DBA Director. Please, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, I was having some challenges. I, I want to thank uh, Engineer AZ uh, very sincerely for his insightful presentation. When I say that it is not just my voice, uh, I'm echoing the voice of many. If you go through the chat, you'll see expression of deep appreciation of the stuff that you have presented. Um, however, there are a few questions for you to answer. So the first question, somebody wants to know how the endemic correct corruption in the country has affected the effectiveness or the integrity of public procurement, just to know how it has affected the effectiveness of procurement. I refer to the endemic corruption in the country. Yes. Do you want me to take them one by one or after? Yes, I think you take take them one by one. There are a few questions, so uh, just go on to answer this and we'll move to the next. Okay, endemic corruption. You know, institutions are not corrupt. Globally, it's the human beings that are corrupt. And so, no matter how much you have in the in the in the legal framework, if the people who operate the system choose to be corrupt, they will be corrupt. But what? The essence of public procurement is to stop corruption from happening, to prevent it from happening rather than spending money chasing spilled milk. The essence of global, uh, global decision on public procurement is that it is a system of government most vulnerable to abuse. And to reduce that, not totally eliminate, is important. And that is why the deployment or the recruitment is very key. So long as we have human beings interfacing and taking decisions, uh, we are going to have challenges. But I think with concerted efforts and public uh, sensitization and personally people involved in the right thing, then we were going to get there. But it wasn't, things are not as, bad as people portray them. Because a city in my, uh, it was just two weeks ago that uh, in a, 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 a webinar like this, in 2008, there were bidding that was done. And we turned down the request of, an, of, an, of a government institution and asked them that they should not give it to X, Y, Z, but to another person. They went about, clamoring for corruption that will give the job to the person because I own the, the company. 
It was only just two weeks ago in a, a forum like this that the person came out and told me that this is what happened, and I didn't know. So some of these shout about corruption, 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 yes, may not necessarily be true, but people just use that to, because it's not a mantra, people use it to get attention. There's no doubt, I can't, I'm not speaking for anybody, but many of them, until somebody is convicted by a court of law, it is still a work in progress because corruption has been with us. It's an English word. It's not only peculiar to Nigeria. So long as it's an English word, it means it exists in all crimes. What the difference is that systems are, are, are designed to make sure that they are minimized. Thank you, uh, Genesee. But, but to underscore this point, there's a follow-up question. To underscore this point mm -hmm. with clarity, somebody want to know how the role of the Bureau a public enterprise has contributed to effectiveness in procurement in the iron and steel industry as well as oil refinery. This is very specific. Okay. Okay. I don't know where is my network. How has your rule uh, affected, positively affected uh, public as well as the oil? Industry? You hear me? You were you dragging. Yes, uh, specifically, it was specific to iron and steel industry and um, oil and gas, right? Am I, am I? The question is about the effect on what uh, the oil and steel sector and the oil refineries are doing. Hello, Engineer Izzy. You couldn't hear me? Hello? Am I back? Are you, you am I hear you? me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Yes, you said about uh, oil and gas and the iron and steel. Yeah, how your role the three, in the Bureau of Oil affected the procurement in those two sectors? Okay, uh, that's, thank you for, for those questions. Basically, you know, the uh, iron and steel sector is, Nigeria is not very active in the iron and steel sector. Most of the major facilities had all been built and they were procured even before the procurement regime became. They, they, they have been there. But in the case of oil and gas, it was a tough a tug of war trying to get into, into the oil and gas. And I'm very happy that one person who facilitated us compelling the oil, Nigeria National Oil Company, NMPC, to subject them to the procurement regime is in this work in this uh, lecture. I, I won't mention his name. He was a member of the board of NFC. And um, each time, all the GMDs, each time we want to subject them to a procurement regime, they have resisted it. But luckily, oh. presidents compelled them. At the last time, before I let go, I compiled a list of uh, 134 projects that we awarded and told Mr. President, President Muhammad Buhari, that this agency have violated the procurement regime and they didn't award, they didn't follow process. And when the first MD, letter Minister of State, uh, Ibe Kachuku, came on board, of course, he came to our office and we sat down and designed a framework for them to go thereafter. I think since then, the NNTC and their subsidiaries have continued to, and because of the peculiar nature, the bureau that I headed, and that is still there, designed a framework and a special threshold for application in the oil and gas sector, taking into consideration their special needs and uh. volume of procurement. So that is already being done in the oil, uh, oil and gas sector. So I can comfortably tell you 
that procurement regime is being applied in oil and gas sector by NNPC and all the subsidiaries. Uh, uh, thank you. I hope Do you I answered want to your question. more on uh, the refineries in particular? Yes, on the, on the, in the case of the refineries, yes, the, the, the term, turnaround refinery is, um, is in process as I'm talking to you now, and they have not made any commitments. And when the bidding process is, 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 is done, they are going to sub, subject it to BPP for a review. So, and that's why they is subject to procurement. I bet you should know that uh, uh, repairing a refinery the procurement process could be two ways. Either by going to the OEM, original equipment manufacturer, because it is not something you get off the shelf. And then you negotiate. After doing that, you go to the BPP for a further review before they can proceed to ensure that the value for money is achieved in the cost. Thank you for your answer. Uh, there's okay. another question there. Yeah. yeah, what is the role of the Bureau of Public procurement in the sale or auctioning of government assets. Okay. The, the bureau, this, uh, that's the section, the, the, each procurement entity is also a disposal entity. The disposal is the, is the opposite of procurement. Except for all the agencies of government that are contained in the Public uh, Bureau of Public Enterprises Act, every other asset of government, before you can dispose them, you must advertise for it. And then the person who wins that asset will be the highest bidder. Uh, let me show you, in the case of uh, MPA and the MASA, Okay, so this time they want to sell their wrecks. This time they want to clear their wrecks, their waterways, to provide for passages. We had always insisted that they advertise for that, and they normally will advertise for wreckages because it's millions and millions of dollars. And so for that disposal, you are expected to advertise because the procurement law requires you to publicly advertise for sale of public assets, except those that are in the Bureau of Public Enterprises decree. Thank you. And the next question. Yeah. I have um, some hand. I have one. Okay. Someone wants to know. Should I go on? All right. Somebody wants to know how. Um, how uh, the, the Bureau of Public uh, Procurement or a procurement officer can identify uh, inflated contracts. Okay. Th there is no hard and fast rule about identifying uh, inflated contracts, except through markets, because you are supposed to be an expert, you ought to have done some market survey especially it's easier for off the shelf items. If you, if you, if I, if I want to buy computers, for instance, it is all over there in the market. You can do market survey to get a hand a feel of how much it is. But if I'm building a dam, it will be difficult for you to say this is inflated, not inflated. So what you do is that you subject the specifications to market. In other words, open competition, the market will throw out the actual cost. But for all the shelf items, cars, you can just go to any car shop and see how much is displayed. So for that, you can have an idea whether the contract is inflated or not. But for services as well, for services, you cannot say, oh, this person cleaning services, for instance, how can, I, how can you know that the cleaning service is, is, uh, is inflated? You can't. The only way I can know is that if somebody says he's paying a cleaner as part of his cost element, he's paying a cleaner one million naira. Of course, you know that uh, he's not he's not telling the truth, right? Or he says he's paying uh, uh, somebody twenty million naira a month as part of cost building up. So it's expected that the procurement officers or professionals are 
would have done some little market survey in the beginning with some little idea of how things are done. All right. Okay, uh, yet another question. Uh, it appears there is uh, uh, a belief that uh, there's a problem with procurement. So this question is about the fact that you mentioned sincere efficient procurement. So this person wants to know whether the problem has fitted with public procurement in Nigeria is that of not both. But a lot of people who are involved in procurement do not understand what procurement is all about. They don't know what the procurement is all about. They are using procurement as a means to interface with contractors for other ulterior motives. They don't have the capacity. And so I can, my, question, my answer to that question is that both, both sincerity and lack of knowledge. Uh there is a question here uh, just sent in not long ago. Uh, say from experience, it is quite obvious that uh, project procurement through budget has caused failures in project delivery. Should public project projects continue to manage this to be managed this way? The essence of public institutions is to be clear. Yeah, the essence of public institutions is to provide public goods. There's no way you can, uh, can uh, government institutions can uh, um, avoid providing public goods, because that's why they are there in the first instance. The essence of public institutions is to provide public goods, works, and services through our taxes. The money that you pay, one way or the other, that government gets, is not meant to be used to pay salaries. It's not used to be meant to be shared to individuals as, uh, as pocket money. They're, used, they're, they're supposed to be used to provide public services, water, health, good roads, airport, hospital services. These are responsibilities of the public sector, institutions. And so the idea of public procurement, not uh, uh, the, the, what, this is about procurement, is ensure that these monies that are being budgeted for are utilized in a manner that is efficient to deliver those goods. The government exists, government exists uh, primarily to provide all those, and that's the essence of government. I cannot build road. It's not my responsibility. It is the government that will build road, and so and they have to engage people to do them. Government don't don't. Government is not a contractor, so government cannot contract it themselves. They have to engage contractors. But in trying to engage contractors, what the law says that you must first of all properly design the road taking into consideration the terrain and the competence of the people. And then the traffic, the, the problem is going to solve. The problem is going to solve is to provide the economy smooth ride and improve movements of goods and services. And then you choose the person who has the capacity to build it and then pay him as a win due. So if any of these things miss, if you don't have the right contractor, if you give a contractor that does not have equipment, you'll be stuck. Right? The, the contractor needs to have good equipment, the people who understand the job, good management skill, and financial capability. And then the people who are supervising them, either as consultants or ministry officials, must also be competent to know when they are doing the wrong thing. And when they have done their job, you also must pay them. And then the projects will move and deliver. And then you have delivered and the sense of public procurement. Thank you very much. Um, yet another question, uh, maybe the last. Um, somebody wants to know if the Public Procurement Act of 2007 is still implementable in government contracts. Yeah. Well, of course, that is that that's not being implemented. I wouldn't know why you say whether it's still implementable, but that's what well, being implemented. I, I, I wonder. I wondered about that. Maybe he believes that uh, uh, probably it's not being implemented from uh, his observations and he wants to know whether it's still in force. No, I, I will ask him, let him go to um, today's paper. You see, people are being prosecuted by EFCC for uh, for avoiding, uh, for contravening public procurement act. So it's being implemented. One of Rabbi Haruna has been raising his hand. Rabbi Haruna. 
Again, uh, good afternoon, sir. Again, I want to thank you, uh, Engineer. Good Ezi. afternoon, sir. Dr. Fela, one person has, there are two people who have raised their hands. Will you, will you give them a chance to? to okay, um, just these two, as the speaker has uh, allowed, uh, just these two, please. Uh, okay, thank you, sir. One. Maruf, is it Maruf? Go ahead. Oh, thank you, sir, for giving me the opportunity to uh, ask this question. Uh, uh, um, um, my name is Maruf. Recently, we were. I was working. In, uh, I'm working in a company. Then we recently, the, the BPP gave uh, to to do some particular projects. But when uh, Engineer Eze was uh, delivering his uh, uh, lecture, he made mention of. Uh, he, made, he explained that we can do selective uh, bidding for some particular uh, kind of procurement, like maybe for, uh, uh, for a particular uh, a specialized product that any other thing is not added. Oh. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we're hearing you. Okay. Okay. Let's make a good example of that. Like, if we want to procure uh, a Binaton uh, fan for, for an MDA, then we went to Binaton company. We find out that the price of that Binaton is much more higher than that of their distributor. As in, we went to the, uh, a company that sells Binaton. They are selling theirs for maybe five naira. Then we went to another uh, Binaton uh, company. They sell their own for say three, three naira. So in that kind of uh, in that kind of situation, and the, we, we've been told that the bidding is selective. So what is BPP is doing in that kind of in in, in, in that kind of scenario to save costs and to have a um, a, a good product at the end. Hope you understand my question, sir. Well, let me try. You are saying that uh, you have chosen a product ordinarily when you are specifying a performance based product, like a fan. A fan, yes. just like computers, you don't specify a brand because once you, yes. specify, once you specify a brand, you have limited competition. You instead specify performance. You need a fan, you need an air conditioner. It doesn't have to be Samsung or Panasonic. Once you put Panasonic or Samsung, yeah, there's, there's no competition. But you can say, I need an air conditioner, 18,000 BTU, or two and a half horsepower, able to do this and all this and all that. So then I can go to the market and advertise and say, hey, I want people who can supply me air conditioners with the following technical specifications. It could be from Panasonic. Samsung, it could be from LG or whatever. So, but in your own instance, you have really narrowed down your procurement to a particular brand and choose oh. to go to the distributor, uh, the manufacturer. But you know, manufacturers, most of the time, if you go directly to them, they will give you costs higher than what they'll get to their distributors to discourage you from coming directly to them. Yes. Because remember, for the distributors, they have a kind of uh, a margin, and that they they do. So what we we'll do in that instance is to restrict the tendering to among the accredited distributors, and that is why if you go to the accredited distributors, even though they're the same product, they may not sell at the same price. Distributors may have a twenty percent margin given to them by the manufacturer. But when they want to sell because of volume, somebody can decide to part with 5% of that 20% uh, 20 margin and sell at 10%. Some other person may insist on getting that 20% on his own. Another person may say, hey, I want to do more volume. I will say, okay, instead of me, let me share the 20% I have gotten from the, and sell only at 5%. 
I will finish it and come back and finish it and come back. So when you now restrict it to the accredited dealers, you will still have some sense of competition. Did I, did I, make, did I make myself clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And that explains you. why if you go to three or four people dealing on the same product, you have three different costs. Uh, Rabiu, uh, you have just a minute to ask your okay, question. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sir, what I'm trying to uh, come up with is how is our existing procurement system or the established procurement system adopted here is compared to what is obtained in fact of the United States of America. That's the uh, best pilot procurement approach in which uh, in that situation, all the, uh, the, the points where the human interface in making decision is eliminated, but rather metrics were involved so that transparency and accountability is promoted. Because like that, the whole essence of procurement is establishing best value. So I want to say how is our established procurement compared to that in which metrics were more involved in decision making instead of human interface? Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's good that you, you uh, Engineer Haruna, you are making this. It's a work in progress, and that's the essence of this uh, sensitization. That in terms of the legal framework, the legal framework is the same. The principles are the same. What you have been taught here is what you'll be taught if you go to George Washington University or World Bank, it's the same. The principles are the same. The law, Nigeria has the same law America has. The difference is in the human beings the human beings and the ability to do simple things right. And so that's why we're going to the next stage of ensuring that this law is amended to, um, by the time I left office, I have developed working with, you know, this United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime to develop an equipment system that will not allow uh, provision for constituency projects and the things like that. And we're about deploying it in, 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 uh, in, in, in six five ministries. But, um, I sought for political authorization to get that deployed. But uh, I'm sure the, the, the political authorization is still uh, waiting, uh, waiting consideration. Because once, you, once you're able to do so, all you need to do is to, and that's all. You know, but somehow, somehow, it's a work in progress, and uh, I'm sure that this this level of um, uh, amendment, uh, luckily, um, the bureau has involved me in the amendment to ensure that all these things we are we, we observe are incorporated in the new law. We just believe that this national assembly will pass it to make it mandatory for that to happen. Without that, we we'll still be battling with where we are. But it's a work in progress. Thank you very much, Engineer uh, for the additional insights you have provided um, by answering these questions in depth. Uh, I will now hand over to Professor uh, Ushunubi uh, to continue from here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ifere. And thank you so much, uh, our sp guest speaker. However, let me quickly mention that Engineer Dr. Eze is a faculty member of the University of Lagos Sustainable Procurement, Environment and Social Standards Center of Excellence, as well as faculty member of the University of Lagos Business School. So he's not just a guest, he is really part of us. So once again, Engineer Eze, thank you for this beautiful, highly educative, highly inspiring insightful and highly provocative uh, delivery. We quite appreciate that very so much, sir. And also let me thank our, uh, the guests of Dr. Eze that have joined online. They are so numerous. I can see a lot of fellows of the Academy. Let me thank of Dr. Eze for uh, this ah, lecture. Please, that is the, uh, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Lagos coming back online. Yes, I was able to listen to part of the lecture. Um, thank you very much, sir, for the lecture. And uh, I'm happy that you accepted the 
invitation given uh, um, informally then, and uh, I think we have been able to educate okay. our people in what the area be, of procurement. I want to assure you that uh, that bringing you to be part of the people that will be involved in our um, New Life Business School lecturing. Thank you very much, every one of you. Thank you, um, Professor Shinobi and your team. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Thank you, sir. So we have back, I've come to the end of today's seminar series. God bless you all. Engineer, looking forward to seeing you in Lagos, sir. Oh, certainly. Thank you so much. And let me thank all my many senior engineers that are here from the yeah. US, from London, from uh, everywhere. I can see Eric Onyewu, I can see Benga, I can see Adedeji, Shekwa Adedeji, I can see Royal Highness, Oti Sanyeji, I can see my daughter, Dr. Nyinye, I can see Ogolo. So many of you here, I want to thank you for honoring us with this uh, your presence. And I hope that I can see my Nadetikbe, I can see President Mukolo, I can see Professor Uche, I can see many of you that are here. Please, I want to thank you for being here. I saw Professor Obuefi from UNN and uh, campus and many of you here. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Okay, that's Professor Uche. Yes. Thank you, sir. We are proud of you, sir. Thank uh, you, sir. It's really insight, insightful. Thank you. Engineer Golo was my executive secretary at the Nigerian Society of Engineers. He's here. Engineer Golo, oh, okay. you're welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you very yeah. much, sir. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Yeah. God bless you for Thanks, this wonderful sir. presentation. We are, we are expecting the slide of this uh, presentation. We'll be so glad to have you, sir. Yeah. Sir, yes, sir, come and take us come and take us how to do business better. How to get contracts from all these public <laughs> Yes, sir. I will, I, that, that's what we have to pay for it. Uh. <laughs> yes, sir, we have to pay for it, sir. <laughs> sir. I'm giving you where their contracts are. There are 930. Thank you, sir. You can, you can go and get contracts. <laughs>